Okay. Um, Every day is a winding road, right? It, it's just taking it day by day. Um, I mean, and I think a lot of people go through different emotions. Um, but, um, you know, it's definitely been uh, amazing to take a step back from everything and sort of reevaluate uh, what what our lives are like. And um, I, I, as tough as it is and as horrible it is for some people, um, there is some beauty uh, in it. And um, for, for me, this time has been really meaningful. It's given me um, much more purpose. Um, so when it first happened, it kind of happened overnight. Like there, we had a service and, you know, we kind of live in a bubble here sometimes at 11 Madison. Mm -hmm. um, we, we were full until the last night. And then, you know, the next day we couldn't open. And we said goodbye to everyone, thinking that we would see each other. Uh, in the next few days and few then um, over time I just realized well quickly I realized that nothing will ever be the same again we have you know 200 people working here at 11 Madison Park and a lot of them were on visas and they had to go back home uh, they'll never come back um, I mean it's the, the capital of a restaurant are the people and without the people this is just a shell and to see all this teamwork this family that we've built over so many years fall apart in just a week or two was really devastating um just un unbelievable and i'm still totally in shock and and you know like as the city comes back, you know, how, how fast will tourism come back? How many people can we seat here? I mean, it's going to be a slow, slow, slow coming back. Um, but like a week into it, I was in my apartment and I was just thinking about, okay, what can I do? And I knew I had a kitchen. Um, I knew I was on the board of Rethink Food, a non-for-profit organization. Um, that was started by someone who worked with me uh, before. I knew I could probably raise some money and um, I had the connection to the suppliers. And, uh, and so I started researching. Uh, I went to like eight different soup kitchens around New York because I wanted to learn what's the cost of a meal for someone in need? What does the packaging look like? What does a meal you know, consist of? And how do people work safe? And as I'm going around the city, I'm, I'm realizing that all the soup kitchens are shutting down because they rely on volunteers and, and uh, a lot of volunteers were elderly, so at risk, so they wouldn't come back to work. Mm -hmm. And nothing about the soup kitchen also was very safe being seeing these spaces. And um, there was this one morning where I went from one place to the next in, in Brooklyn. Uh, my destination was the Navy Yard uh, in Brooklyn, super industrial area. And um, I was in Uber, not wearing a mask, not wearing gloves, still not really know what's going on. Talking to some of my leaders on my team and um, telling them my idea. Um, and these are the people who helped me create the best restaurant in the world. They would do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. They guided me, they helped me, they collaborated with me. And at that time, no one thought that this was a good idea. And everyone advised me strongly against it. it says too dangerous, too risky, too many liabilities. This is not the time to do this. So it was this gray morning, uh, it was drizzling, it was cold. And now the driver drops me off uh, at the Navy Yard in Brooklyn, which I've only been once before. And I'm standing in, in the middle of these gray buildings. I didn't even know where I was going. And, um, and then I got two text messages about, you know, the, 
the, the passing of, of the chef Floyd Cardoz, who I knew very well. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was probably one of the lowest, that was probably the lowest point in this whole journey. And uh, I was just standing there. I didn't even know where I was going. <laughs> Go see another soup kitchen. Mm -hmm. and, and having, you know, knowing that everyone is against this idea. But I was just standing there and I, it was either, I couldn't just stop there. I had to keep it moving. So it, it wasn't even like I had much of a decision to make. It was like, right. are you just going to stand here or are you going to keep moving? And I just kept moving. I was meeting um, actually Winston, one of the uh, founders of Rethink. He took me down in the basement kitchen. You know, there were like three people working. It's very grim. And, uh, you know, I took notes on all, the, on all the procedures they were doing, how they're checking in people who come to work, taking temperatures, all this stuff, working in distance, working in small groups. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so there was really only moving forward. And on the way back, um, I was wearing a mask in the Uber and um, I called Amex. American Express. I thought about how could I, you know, get some money together quickly. And um, I called other people and, and people really showed up quickly. And mm -hmm. so three days later, um, we got it off the ground. One of the most shocking uh, moments was also when I sent an email out to 250 people asking people to come and help me to work. And only eight people replied. People were really, really scared. Um, and uh, yeah, the first few days, it was like at the very beginning when I started at 11 Madison. In 2006, I was, you know, 27 years old, started, wanted to build the best restaurant in the world. No one had an idea who I was. I asked people to work, you know, 80 hours a week and I pay them 40. And people, and I had to convince everyone that this was a good idea. Um, so I found myself back in the kitchen almost by myself with a few people, you know, telling everyone they're doing a good job 10 times a day so they would show up again the next day. Um, so it was kind of humbling and beautiful. Um, one of the most beautiful things was to get back in touch with food in a different way food is so powerful food is so magical food touches us all in so many different ways and um three days into it i was thinking about i'm like why am i just doing this now why did it take this crisis for me to start thinking in this way to be a food um, activist yeah, it's just like I, I was um I I was kind of like blaming myself, but then I then I also figured out that um I believe that as I saw the soup kitchens and as I worked with Rethink, Rethink would take food, leftover food from restaurant and repurpose it and then you know mm -hmm. bring it to people in need. It's quite complicated, it's many steps. And as we're cooking 3000 meals a day here at 11 Madison Park, with not that much effort, I realized that every restaurant produces inexpensive, delicious meals on a daily basis. Um, that's how we feed our staff, mm -hmm. um, that's family meal. We work with the suppliers to get us product, you know, lesser price, but still good. We use what we don't use for a dish, and that's how we make meals. So through Rethink, we are getting, we raise the money, but these soup kitchens are getting around $5 per meal. So the non-for-profit organizations are buying these meals from these places. So. I'm realizing that as a chef, if I have a business, a restaurant, and I could sell 200 of those meals every day, that's $1,000 a 
that a restaurant would receive. Mm -hmm. That is a complete game changer from a business side as a restaurant owner. So like if every restaurant could produce 200 meals and would get a thousand dollars, it changes the business model. It helps pay for the rent. It helps pay for the staff, things that we already are paying for. Right. And every kitchen has its down times in the afternoons, in the mornings. There's always a moment. I mean, even, and this is even for some of the fast casual businesses, like our, our, our made nice uh, concept in, in the afternoon between two and five o'clock, um, it would be so easy to produce some of those meals. And if we would even get paid for it, then that would be incredible. So I believe that to fight hunger uh, in this country, and I think to end hunger in this country, I think through restaurants, this is possible. Um, and obviously the funding has to come a smaller portion of fundraising, but then a larger portion of the government. And then there's also some tax benefits. Mm -hmm. But so after, you know, four years ago, when as a chef, I, I, I reached so many things. I was, you know, three Mishnah stars, four stars, New York Times, James Beard, Evie Award, mm -hmm. number one in the world. Um, and I understood that these things always were sort of these kind of made up goals or almost this carrot that you use to motivate the team, to motivate yourself. Intellectually, I understood that there was no best restaurant in the world, but it was an easy goal to motivate the staff with. It was very easy to explain what the goal was. Right. And it was very powerful. And when we became number one in the world, for me, I definitely uh, felt a little bit lost. I was like, okay, for 10 years, for 10 years, I would wake up every morning chasing that goal. Mm -hmm. um, and I understood that that wasn't, everything you know um but then when it's taken away then you get up and now what what are you going to tell your staff now what are we doing today you know <laughs> so i always knew that there had to be a bigger meaning that there had to be a higher purpose and it always bothered me that only the privileged get to experience 11 madison park um, but at the same time, I still really enjoy doing this food in an art form mm -hmm. as a performance. I, I love working with these expensive ingredients with a team of very skilled people, um, serving the food on beautiful China in a beautiful setting. Um, but I think now I feel that under one roof, like 11 Madison Park, it's actually possible to do both. And I have found a whole new purpose through this, beyond the crisis. I, I wanna continue to do food as art and you know feed the top 1%, but then I really wanna put my effort through 11 Madison Park, but, but through all the other restaurants um, and feeding, you know, the, 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 the bottom 10%. Mm -hmm. And as I, I have written so many books and shared my recipes of food, the one recipe that I really want to share with the world, I, and, and I'm going to spend the next 20 years on this, is mm -hmm. if we can demonstrate the recipe that a restaurant can do both, that's the recipe I would love for everyone to copy. And I that's think that's your, how we That's can, your legacy. Yeah. That's your true legacy. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, man, how um, parallel um, our stories are, and even weirder how 
it took something like this to to make create especially with creatives I, I always wondered how our creatives um dealing with what's going on um you know i've i've had this is actually right this is sliced down right in the middle um yes. there are people on my left that see this as uh uh, a challenge to not only rise to and not only overcome, but really a chance to get a head start and and rewrite history for 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 the good, for the greater good. Um, and on the other uh, no, on the other hand, um, there are some people. For lack of a better term, I'll say that we're very that that we're unprepared for this to happen. Yeah, and it's so easy to wallow in the mire and just sink to a new low, and you worry yourself you worry yourself into a place where um, you become you become uh, uh, frozen or paralyzed. And, um, and, you know, I, I mean, there's at least six or seven personal friends of mine that, you know, are just now just currently in the law, like, I don't know what to do. I can't, you know, it's too overwhelming for me. And it, it saddens me to see that. But um, for for team move straight ahead, as I will yeah. dub this. Um, I I actually feel this is going to be more fulfilling. Um, even in my particular situation, um, of course, people in my corner were a little too ecstatic that it took something like this to slow me down. Yeah. If you will, um, because I've I've been hearing this, you're doing too much, yeah. Uh, talk for at least the last eleven or twelve years. I mean, you know me, like <laughs> I'll get done a DJ gig at four, and then I'll book a studio session after like a three hour nap and start at six in the morning, and then <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, but I I will say that um, in the past. 40 uh, this has been 40 days for me right now i'm up yeah. i'm up here i'm up here uh where are you i'm 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 in uh i'm in westchester at a uh at a friend's house and they they kind of have like a, a a large estate up here uh-huh and um gave me run of the the guest house nice uh, i have a castle behind me <laughs> I'm staying, I'm staying in the kids the kids nursery <laughs> um but this is you know in, in the maybe the first 10 days i was sinking in sinking in like oh god i gotta take care of my band and i have a staff of 31 people I have to take care of like i got i got books to sell i got uh the movies to score i got movies yeah. to direct i got stuff to produce like all these things that i made for myself and um you know I, I gotta say that sitting really just sitting in silence for three days i'm 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 grateful that i had a uh a life that allows for at least sitting with my thoughts and clearing my head because, you know, the thing that I'm telling everybody about now is that um, you cannot make crucial life decisions uh, with a cluttered mind yeah. and having a clear head and a clear 
uh, thought process to make to make uh, the necessary round of moves um, is is uh, having a clear head is 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 so important right now. And um, you know what's so weird is that uh, I I made a decision to to sort of kind of put my to put myself in a position uh, to get out of my comfort, to get out of my comfort zone. Yes. I, I, I've been for the last 10 years, probably coasting. I mean, in a coasting at a great altitude, but nevertheless coasting, not this, but more, yes. but more of this. And, um, you know, this week alone, I probably, this week alone, I faced my world's biggest fear. I mean, and people are often like head scratching, like, wait a minute, you, you do this all the time. Um, I, I have been for the last five years rejecting every offer for public speaking that there is. Yes. Um, I, nothing, nothing used to uh, make me more fearful than the thought of having to give like a, a graduation commencement speech to kids yes. or college students. And um, after like a good six or seven years of like, nope, 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 nope. Um, I finally gave my first key address last week at university, uh, U, at UMass. Amazing. And um, I, you know, I, I am kicking myself on depriving myself and depriving other people of the knowledge that I've learned uh, in my 25 year history and how, you know, it's like when the elephant's afraid of a little mouse, yes. it's it like, I'm so, I was touched by the, you know, at them receiving it. And I guess I was in my head about, oh, uh, it'll be a disaster or I haven't lived an epic life to to warrant me having sage advice, you know, for these kids and whatnot. Um, and I was just clearly in my head. And that's the one, I mean, that's the one lesson that I I want to, I want to commend you for, I mean, cause I know, especially, um, in the, in the culinary world, um, a lot of heartbreaking decisions had to be made. Like I know, like a lot of your staff is your family, you know, you're their coach and these people, like, I know people who, who, whose dream it is just to wash dishes for you. You know, what I mean? <laughs> like it's their dream, um, and I I know, and I know that that was a hard decision. And you know, I I I I will say that I I too had to have, um, not not as epic as as or as massive as as two hundred and fifty people, but you know, there are a lot of people that I've been working with that I you know, just for the time being, had to sort of let go and. It, you know, it was done with tears and all that stuff, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm saying that in, in the last 40 days now I feel like I have a new, a new purpose that really doesn't have to require a drum set or mm -hmm. my, my musical smarts and, you know, all those things that I've been, clutching onto like pearls you know yes and um and if i admit it probably i knew all along that you and i are probably slowly stepping stepping into our activism roles yeah uh i i, I was rather reluctant even though i knew it all along that yeah it's gonna be <laughs> The second, the second half of my life is is not only going to fulfill 
I mean, it's needed in the world and it's going to fulfill you as a human being. And I think um, I'm, I'm okay with that now. I think because everyone's, I think we're all going through that at the same time. Like, it's not like you're, it's not like we were in what we'll call normal times. And then suddenly, you know, a divine force was like, okay, well, I'm going to test you and take all of your culinary dreams away, Daniel. Yeah. And just erase you. <laughs> And now it's like, what do I do what, while the world's still like thriving and going on? Like we're all at this place right now. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's brilliant. And, you know, what's even crazier is um, you're not, you're kind of not alone because a lot of, um, especially with the, the, the kids at the, the food and finance um school that tag me on their projects i'm seeing that like a lot of people in the food uh in the culinary world are now you know they're they're full-fledged food activists and now we're seeing food activism done in the in in an amazing way and uh in a fulfilling way so you're actually on on the right track like using your platform uh, to serve people and to educate people and to use it as, as, as food activism and bring awareness to people that aren't necessarily, uh, aware that such a thing is needed. So, you know, I applaud you for that, man. Thank you. I applaud you. Yeah. It's, it's also, I mean, actually, there, there was a documentary in, in 68 um, on PBS about food insecurity. And, and after that documentary, um, it was during the time Nixon was president, and he actually was able to um, almost end hunger in this country. And um, to end hunger in this country is something that is possible. Mm -hmm. There is enough there are enough kitchens there are enough chefs and there is enough food to feed everyone and some of the things we're doing with these food pantries and stuff um they're they're so out of date they're from like the 70s and we're still operating these things the way we're like in the 70s and food has changed so much farming has changed so much so I think this is a goal that, that, that we, it's, it's going to take a lot of people, but, it, but if we all want to address it together, we can, we can solve it. That, yeah, that's, that's also another thing. Um, you know, I, I'm definitely guilty of, well, somebody else will, somebody will figure that out. You know, that was always my thing. Somebody will figure it out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then, you know, suddenly it, it comes to you an epiphany that you're going to have to be the, the change that you want to see. Yeah. And you're going to have to be that person. Um, and I'm slowly realizing, no, I'm, dude, I'll, I'll follow you wherever you go, man. Like, you know. Likewise. Likewise. I appreciate that, man. Likewise. Well, I, I have so much respect for you, and I'm so happy that over the past 10 years, our path slowly started cross, to, yeah. you know, cross and, and have crossed more and more. And, and uh, I mean, we just had dinner together right before this whole shit went down. <laughs> Shit, I think that was the last restaurant. Wow. <laughs> that was my that was my last restaurant. So I, just, I just saw a post on the internet, like, what was your last restaurant experience? And I was like, oh, wow. It was with Daniel. How, how uh, poetic and apropos. You remember the time where people would go together into one place and all eat, even people who don't know each other around you? <laughs> do you do you ever think do you ever think that way of because the one thing that i know america is big on is kind of like amnesia 
um, oftentimes, I mean, no tragedy has ever struck like this particular tragedy. So, you know, oftentimes uh, an isolated tragedy will happen and it's thoughts and prayers and we think about it. And usually in about three weeks, it's just, oh, back to normal. Yes. Do you think that this is a game changer in terms of like, nobody will ever be the same after this? And not in, and not even in the just negative way of nobody will ever be the same, but do you just think it's a whole new way of how ideas are implemented or how creativity or, you know, just just this Saturday, I, I know that you, you also were connected uh, to the Nomad for a while. Um, this Saturday, uh, a friend of mine had a virtual uh, Zoom birthday party uh-huh. and had a and had a magician perform. And the magician was actually entertaining. And I hit up Dan White and yes. I showed him like a I showed him like a a, a, a fifteen second clip. You know, because you know, I I haven't even spoken to him. Like the I mean the creatives I'm speaking to are like directly like my engineers and the guys at my show that you know at the Tonight Show and whatnot, the writers and all those things. Yeah. But, you know, I was wondering about like Dan White as well. Like, whoa, how's how's this gonna affect him? Where yeah. you know, that sort of thing. And I showed him that clip. And you know, he was like, Thank you for it was like he was like, wow, thank you for sending this to me. And I was like, I was showing him that, you know, I, I don't know why I felt the need to send this to you, but in case you were feeling discouraged about yeah, what your future is, um, you know, I'm currently at a, a Zoom birthday celebration with 400 people and a, a magician hmm. who's kind of wowing us right now. And, you know, this is my... My girlfriend and I were having date night, like holding our, uh, <laughs> our our computers in our hands, watching a magician, and um, you know, so that that's kind of even he's learning how to adjust. So I mean, for you though, do you do you feel as though nothing will be the same after this, as far as the idea of what I what I call uh, culinary art experiences. You know, I think, and that's why this is why I wanted to stay in New York for a while during this, because I think artists are some of the most sensitive people and will react to this in beautiful ways. Mm-hmm. And I think the the best art, music, or paintings or sculpture or um, performance or foods is is really who who has the finger on the pulse the most accurate right it's it's very much about the moment when a new song comes out or a new painting and it's it's the context and so for me i really wanted to be here because i really wanted to feel it and and in a way, I feel very privileged that I get to be he- I'm healthy. I'm I'm at an age group that's less you know affected by this. Thankfully, right. I'm very careful. But I, I'm feeling kind of really grateful to experience it firsthand. And I think to really react to what's happening, it would be very hard to do so from the sidelines. Um, so I think my first reaction, and you know, we always talk about what's the next chapter of 11 Madison Park. And we had, you know, so many ideas and we were going to launch a new 11 Madison Park this fall. Uh, we've been working a lot on this. Um, but the next chapter of 11 Madison Park is now, this is a significant chapter of our creative um, reaction to what's going on in the world. 
and and when we open the doors again and hopefully we are um that will be yet another reaction to what we think the city uh will will crave mm -hmm. um some some of the thoughts i have is definitely i think i think people will want quality um pe people people love food as art as performance people love quality ingredients i think actually i think also this crisis has has also shed a light on how broken uh, some of our farming and some of our food systems are and mm -hmm. i think to to make everything even more meaningful i think everything in all parts of life this 40 days and by the way do you know where quarantine comes from the word no it comes from it comes from quaranta which is 40 40 days and uh it's from italy when people mm -hmm. came off the the those ships they oh. had to quarantine for 40 days um, <laughs> oh yes I didn't know. um but i think just more meaning to everything i think this is also a little bit like this whole time it has been a little bit of a bullshit detector like when you look at certain art that people before people were traveling all over the world to see the same piece of art in mm -hmm. hong kong in zurich in basel in miami and 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 today after sitting quiet for 40 days you look at some of this art and you're like really that's what people were chasing <laughs> do you know and and yeah. same with restaurants and same with music and and same with everything so so i think to find more meaning and to have a higher purpose we just need to have a higher purpose we all need to find ways of giving back and when we talk about sustainability it's not just about you know recycling and composting it's also about feeding everyone um and i think I, I think to integrate this into the new life will be key um it will be key in 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 411 madison park and restaurants such as to to have a future and a way forward well if uh my my instincts are correct I, I think you're 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 the man that will lead the charge and the the, the charge is in good hands man thank you thank you i think we need i think we need to create we need to create some i think bono did an amazing job with red mm -hmm. and and i think i think to end hunger in america we we need to think of the organization that we built we need to think of it as as building a brand a company a brand like the coolest brands we know uh we can't think of it so much as a non-for-profit organization it it needs to be much bigger and it needs to be run like a business and i think if people like yourself me really smart people who care deeply about this and i know you are you have mm -hmm. always cared about this um you've cared about this before i have um and if we get a group of people together with all unique skills um we can end hunger in this country let's do uh, it yeah right let's do it your mouth to god's ears let's yeah. do it yeah i'm with that amazing so as soon amazing. as as soon as <laughs> i don't need i was about to say let's call a meeting i mean we'll just have, we have zoom now <laughs> we <don't have> <laughs> well we should really think about you know who are who are I had an amazing conversation 
with um, a very important sort of family uh, mm -hmm. who have a lot of resources and, and are spending a lot in this in this uh, in in this um, you know to give back and hunger and things. Right. And so I was talking to them and they could feel my passion and, and my story and they were very touched by um, this sort of realization during this time. And then she was saying, and I thought it was really interesting. She said, hey, I hear you, I feel you. I want you to take a step back and just kind of look at what you need as a person, what you want deep in your heart for the next 10, 20 years, and really evaluate to make sure that the fire you have for this is strong enough. Because it's gonna take, it's gonna take as much as when you want it to be the best chef in the world. It's gonna take that kind of effort. And she said, the resources, there's going to be a lot of different puzzle pieces needed. And they're all going to be available. But if your fire isn't strong enough, if you're getting up on that stage and you say you want to do this, mm -hmm. you really have to make sure that you have everything you need to go all the way. And I think that was kind of like, for sure, like, you know, I had like this epiphany three days into doing these meals and this excitement and idea and I found a higher purpose. But she definitely made me uh, take a step back and this happened like four weeks ago. Right. And I definitely had a few weeks to think about it to really make sure the passion and the fire and you know the drive is strong enough to really take this on. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not it, a lot of people working on this and have done amazing work, um, but it's going to take a lot. It's, it's, is your is your first step the restructuring of what you feel the soup kitchen represents? Because even here in soup kitchen, like it feels so forties. It yeah, feels so. It's, it feels so. Uh, uh, uh what's what's the time period um the feel so great depression great depression yeah and even at that there's such a there's such a shame associated i don't think any food service should come with a shame title you yeah. know what i mean yeah and it's so stigmatized so even the fact that you're trying to cross the aisle to figure out how to reconfigure and update it. Um, and it's so weird that you're mentioning this because um, even now uh, I'm reading about how uh, like new, new alternative foods, like the impossible burgers of the world and, and the, uh, oh my God, did I lose you? Okay. Uh, no, no, yeah. <laughs> How, how the new companies of the world are um, trying to reconfigure one, how to save the environment, but also how to sustain and feed people. Um, and also with new ways of farming. I learned about new farming when I went to food and finance high school. I didn't even know that you could farm on a rooftop. Yeah. I mean, they had an irrigation system with fish. I didn't know that you could raise fish. <laughs> And, you know, these kids are raising fish, salmon, on their rooftop in their, in their high school. But, um, <laughs> yeah, for you, is, it, is step one figuring out how to reconfigure soup kitchens or, or how to reconfigure the, the, the feeding system for people? Like, where do you... Like in those, in that 10,000 piece puzzle, like what's step number one? For me, step number one is that we can fully integrate it into our own restaurant where we 
where we're doing everything under one roof mm -hmm. and then really raising awareness. Okay. And then I think, and then I think be, because I think in the beginning it starts with, you know, raising funds uh, from individuals and maybe corporate sponsors. Maybe we can work with America, with credit cards who give, you know, but, but, but it has to be such that we get a few people on board who are doing this and we're mm -hmm. showing to the world that this can work. That if a restaurant gets $5 for a meal, that they can produce these meals and they want to do it. It needs to be a no brainer for restaurants to sign on to it. I Have think you talked to your peers yet? Like the way that I talk to my musician peers. Yes. That I'm not like right now, is there a brain trust of, of, of you, what I, you beardites? I don't know. <laughs> you Michelinites. <laughs> There, there is a, there is a little bit. Um, I, you know, Sean Brock just yeah. started with that same program. Um, but then also, uh, you know, my friend Basu from a quick casual uh, concept in day, mm -hmm. he is doing it. Um, my friend James Kent from Crown Chai is doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So. You know, like everything, man, it's also competitive. And, and, and that's another part. Like, <laughs> I'm like, when I started doing this work only a few weeks ago, right away, I could feel it. Oh, shit. This is why is this also competitive, man? Oh, who's going to race to be the, the food savior? <laughs> I won. I won. Yeah. No, it's like that. Uh, with, with quarantine G DJing. Yes. It was like, it was five of us. <laughs> oh god man but it, you know what i needed that because even with djing in the beginning you know the, the it really starts when you decide okay this is a thing and for me we were sort of it was sort of up in the air like so or am i just am i off the radar for 14 days and do we go back to work yeah, you know, this will this will be solved by it's got to be solved by May, right? Yeah. It's got to be solved by May. <laughs> oh yeah, they'll figure something in sixty days, right? Right? Wrong. So I was semi lazadaisical, and then the day I, I I saw something on MSNBC that had me concerned, and I was watching Rachel Maddow, and that's when I realized oh, it might be best to beat the curve on this. Now, for me, for me at least, because of the neighborhood I, that, I, that I'm in, in downtown uh -huh. Manhattan, there's kind of a different level of thinking that, that is almost the opposite of someone that's in an area that could seem rather apocalyptic. Like, I got friends that are, you know, in an area where it feels very apocalyptic, very end of the world is very, it's not safe to go outside, very, you know, the walls are closing in on me. I'm going to go create, you know, whereas in my neighborhood, it was like a little bit too relaxed. Yeah. Like, wait, are you, you know, I'm the only person in my building with like a mask and the suit on and everyone else is like, Oh, Hey, uh, of course, love them going out for a jog. And I'm like, wait a minute, don't touch me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm running off the elevator. So once I realized that that was the energy I was, I was dealing with, I was like, okay, well, I'm out of here. You know, I have, I'm in this small apartment. Like, who do I know? Like, who are my 25 years of, 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 of this life that I've had? Like, where can I, where where can I get some space where I'm not I won't be a bother? And initially, my first goal was to to go out to, of course, the food God himself, uh, Shep Gordon, out in Maui. But you know, Shep's about to have a baby, and you know, Hawaii's getting hard hit hard right now. Like yeah. any place that's like a tourist, a a tourist industry, uh, especially Shep, because you know he has his hands in so many restaurants. 
yeah. and so many hotels that you know Hawaii is like really getting to hit the heart because their whole economy is based on tourism of which nobody's coming to what you know that sort of thing yeah so um that was problematic and so you know I'd, I'd, again I I'd, had a friend of upstate New York that was like, you know, you and your girlfriend can come up here. You know, there's a large space. There's a chicken farm. There's Amazing. an apple orchard. And so, um, you know, it's a little weird, but, <laughs> you know, I can adjust to it. But the thing was, is that in those two days of moving, that's when my manager nudged me a little bit and says, hey, um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, D-Nice is kind of killing the game right now with quarantine DJ. So... <laughs> I know that you've been flirting with this. You know, occasionally I would do it like once in a blue moon, like when I brought like new records or something. Yes. I was like, all right, let me let me go online and show people like new weird records that I brought it, that sort of thing. Um, but he kind of told me it would behoove you to do that thing that you were doing when you brought records, like do it in real time, because I feel like this is gonna be your your future for the next year and a half and i said whoa, whoa, whoa you mean may right he's like yeah i mean may may 2021 <laughs> and so you know i had to i think that's the point where i felt the walls closing in on me like no like i, I worked so i worked so hard to get here like no this this can't be how how it ends and um and, you know, again, he was like, no, this is not how it ends. This is actually how it's going to begin. And so, this is you know, crazy, man. I, I, had my, I had my pity party for like three days. But then in those three days, uh, once, I mean, luckily I, I pushed through because, again, like to, to really make your mind up and to decide that this is going to be your new future was just weird to me. It's like, okay, so. I'm going to be in a room by myself and, but yet I'm going to prepare similar like you, similar to what you guys used to do on the, the, the second or third floor. We're trying to figure out next year's menu. Yeah. Like, it's like, okay, so I'm going to wake up at six in the morning and try to rack my brains out, trying to figure out how to make this James Brown song and this song by the killers connect to each other. <laughs> Yeah. And all the spots in between. And I'm going to do it for nobody watching me. Or at least in my mind, it just, yes. you know. I used, to, I used to tease Prince all the time. Prince was the only person that would quarantine club. Like, he would go to a night spot and have the entire club emptied out. And it was just him and his eight friends. <laughs> dancing and partying, like... <laughs> Meanwhile, outside the club is like 2,000 people waiting to get in line and like, no, Prince ain't going to ever let you guys in. Like, you know, and I just wondered, I asked the DJ, like, how are you able to do a good DJ set when only eight people are dancing and the rest of everyone's outside because Prince won't let them in? Like, and, you know, at the time, his DJ, uh, DJ Rashid was just like, that's how he likes it. You know, I've, I've just, I've adjusted to it. This, I want to DJ for Prince and Prince only likes to party with 12 people. So, wow. you know, and so I got used to it quick, fast. And, um, you know, now it's, it's the, the, the skies are the limit. So, I mean, I stopped chasing the carrot of like being the world's, you know, I I I never wanted the top the title of being like the the world's top quarantine DJ. I decided <laughs> similar similar to what you figure out what your destiny was. I realized my destiny is teaching music. Yeah. And so even though it's disguised in a DJ set, what I'm doing is, you know, if the if the spirit hits me, I will sit and I'll talk and I'll analyze a record like this weekend, I did over uh, 11 hours of James Brown's music and his life's work. I saw some of it. It was amazing. Thank you. And amazing. I feel fulfilled. Like, this is stuff that I could never, ever do 
uh, in a nightclub. Like, I can't stop a song to explain. Well, in 1967, after a, a show at one in the morning, he called a, a session, uh, blah, 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 blah. And then they drove four miles to Cincinnati, Ohio. Like, I can't give the history. But, like, you can't do that in a nightclub. No. But here, it's like I feel so fulfilled. So, yeah, this this forced us to find our destiny, man. And your knowledge, it's true. Like your knowledge is so vast. I, I don't know if there there aren't a lot of people who know as much about music as you are. And for you to share this is like you need to share it. It's amazing. Exactly. For, you. for me, it's, it's therapeutic. Like listen. sharing therapeutic. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, what thank about, you. What about, what about a, a record? What about a, a Roots record? Um, my. You know, it's it's weird enough that uh, just to do Fallon is such a is such a weird thing now. It's like we're making music together, but we're piecemealing it. Like someone's establishes a metronome click track, and then we mail that track to each member of the Roots, and we just have to pretend what the other guy's playing as we play to this song by ourselves. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and yet it sounds and yet you know it winds up you know still sounding that's that's the sign of of when you played uh music with so, someone for so long yeah and you know them so well that um that even in not playing with them uh it, it the you chemistry is still them. there yeah but I, I i do i gotta say that i i do miss the the interaction. I I, I, do, I miss the small things that I'm not getting. Like uh, just, you know, pizza. I'm saying I miss Pizza Fridays. Uh, <laughs> no, like I, I miss Pizza Fridays and, you know, just, you know, making fun of our, our guitar player and our tuba player, like, rank it on each other I'm, i miss getting my beard trim every monday <laughs> <laughs> i miss uh having uh black hair in, in my beard so. yeah. <laughs> no but you know i i'm now we we have a, a another purpose in life and, and a new step and i i can't wait to see what the results are man that's right i'm, I'm gonna have to pull in a second i i have a uh <laughs> I have another virtual Zoom meeting to do with uh, Jimmy Fallon. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I'll give him my best. Well, and, thank you, um, man. You're the we'll man. Be in touch. Uh, and you're, will... in, you're such an inspiration, and, and I'm so glad to be connected in this way. Well, thank you, sir. I mean, you're 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 one of my heroes, man. You're you're definitely a creative inspiration for me, man, and I appreciate that. Likewise. All right. Love you, man. Love you too. See you, man. Bye. Be well. Bye. Bye.